Hey everybody, tonight we have with us Joe Taylor. He is the CEO, director, you know, curator of Mount Blanco Fossil Museum. He's going to be talking to us not only about the fossils that he's um, got on his in on his in his museum, as well as discoveries that he's made uh, regarding mastodons. And we're got him on here, and we're looking forward to this. And Joe Taylor is coming up next. Welcome to the Three Beards Podcast. My name is Craig, along with Austin and Chris. Passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century. Let me out. Everybody, welcome to the show. Uh, it's been been a crazy week, man. We just got tons of rain over here. My God, I mean, especially <laughs> today. I was I couldn't wait to get my work clothes off. They were completely soaked. Yeah, I haven't gotten a shower yet. <laughs> yeah, first thing into the bathtub. It's all those things did. Yeah, because it just you know it's, it's pretty amazing when your shirt goes splat right into the right into the. Day. It's like yeah, that's crazy. All right, so everybody at this time, enough, enough banter. We need to bring on our the man Joe Taylor from Mount Blanco Fossil Museum. How are you, sir? I'm okay. Shouldn't complain. <clears throat> we've had way more rain we want here. And after that tornado hit us, we've had a half inch or more in the uh, water in the museum for several days, which we're trying to deal oh. with. So uh, it hasn't hurt any of the big fossils yet. The mastodons have all survived. Nice. And it's, when I was doing the research to get prepared for this, I was looking um, at the site in some of the pictures that mastodon one that you have that is pretty impressive well that there's mastodon. the the burning tree mastodon is uh, the complete skeleton that's one that had living bacteria in the intestines 38 kinds i think of still living mammal intestinal bacteria and <clears throat> its stomach contents were there it had a gallstone it had been butchered by people that must have been at least 10 12 feet tall in order to pull the skin off the thing so that's our primary one. The uh, other one is from uh, uh, Plymouth, uh, uh, Indiana. It's probably a record. <clears throat> the tusks are really long. They're complete, but they were shattered. They run over several times by uh, steam engines back in the uh, <clears throat> uh, 20s when they drained those, those swamps up there. And <clears throat> so I took them all apart. It took me a year and a half to dry out the tusks. I put them all back together. Got rid of the mildew, uh, re rejoined everything and fixed them all, and they're complete right down to the thin roots, which you almost never get. The one I'm working on now, uh, well, there's been lots of other ones, but uh, this one is uh, from Florida, from you guys' neighborhood out there somewhere, and it's so what? heavy it takes four guys to move it. <clears throat> Where was that at? I don't really know the the fellow that that acquired it and sent it to me to uh, to be fixed up. Uh, it didn't say, and sometimes you don't ask, you know, because they're afraid that we're to get around, and if it's a commercial pit or something, you'll have a lot of guys come out there, universities, they're afraid they'll shut them down. So I don't always ask where the thing came from. I know about where it came from. I, I trust the source, but <clears throat> uh, Florida has more mastodons and just about anything it's amazing and and all that they got huge giant stuff there huge stuff 
Now, I, I've heard you say that before, and that was one of the questions like I had set and I was going to ask you. What is your thinking you know, behind that of why Florida is such, seems to have such a, you know, best word, he's like just this mass quantity of mastodons down here. Cause is, was it during the ice age that this was a warmer area? And so they came down here to forage and that's how they got, ended up getting down here. Uh, all the mastodons, mammoths, all that, they're all, all given the, you know, they're always said to be ice age animals. And that's, uh, it's sort of a loose term, uh, mm -hmm. but, because they want to cover such a wide span of years, it, it really isn't a good term in a lot of ways. And as far as I can tell, having worked on uh, the so-called Ice Age mammoths, mastodons, horses, uh, you name it, from Alaska, where it is really cold now, <clears throat> all over the Midwest, Texas, and uh, uh, the coast of, uh, well, even stuff out in California, and, all, and especially in, in uh, Florida, it, it had to be warm. The ice age had to be warm. There was ice, yes, which had apparently had formed rather quickly. And then it began to melt. It began to slide south and southeast. And it melted back as fast as it slid south. So that's why they disappeared. They just melted. And I've, I've never heard of any animals <clears throat> being found in any of the icebergs, not here in the United States or anywhere else. I think they were there. They just walked around them. But it must have been uh, pretty temperate because the peat bogs in Ohio, where all these mastodons come from, and all that stuff there in Florida, the reason they're black, or the reason they're turned brown, is because of so much tannin in the soil that that it it turns them turns them black in Florida. <clears throat> so it had to be really verdant when they were there. Well, you know, if you go to Ohio now, it's pretty verdant there during the winter time, but it's too cold for an elephant. I mean, it gets really cold there. Yeah. Where, where about in Florida do you see the most fossils and stuff of um, mammoths? Oh, uh, there's a place called the Lizy Pit. <clears throat> there's uh, a big mastodon, kind of wrongly named Priscilla. It's a big bull, uh, but but he's you know I I don't again I don't know where exactly where he's from, but it's one of those so. Uh, those shell pits when they're digging up the shells, you know, I oh, guess yeah, yeah. roads or something. Lime and stuff. Yep, yeah, that's no. that's where uh, uh, a lot of the, some of these things came from. And there's just tons of stuff. A lot of these guys. Uh, well, if you're if you know where the uh, what is that river? <clears throat> it's over there near Plant, Florida, uh, not far Plant. from uh, Plant City. Yeah, I believe so. There's some there's some river that's out there or that that go into the ocean, and a lot of divers uh, dive down there. They'll dive down 10, 15 feet, and here's all these mastodon bones and teeth and horse <laughs> bones by the thousands. <clears throat> One guy told me he had uh, I think he had two box cars full of bones that he had uh, snorkeled out of the sand down there. So <clears throat> wow. it's it's probably more than Texas, but there's a lot of this stuff on the Texas coast. And in fact, uh, one of the biggest uh, mammoths that I've ever worked on was was from uh, uh, down at uh, Lake Jackson. Not well, it, that's about Houston there at Clute, Texas. This thing was down uh, 35 feet below the top because they dug down a big old sand pit, and it was 15 feet below current sea level. So you got to figure, okay, now how did that thing get down there? Uh, because it, it looked like a living area. I told the guys that, <clears throat> that that excavated most of it. I said, I think this was a living area kill site. And the reason for that, some of the bones are jet black because they've been, they've been weathered longer. So they've taken on more mineral. Others were brown or lighter brown, <clears throat> which indicates they hadn't been dead as long. So there might be a difference of 10, 15 years. This one horse bone was jet black, but it's real rough, like a weathered bone. And hard as a rock, and there were deer bones <clears throat> and other bones that were uh, a nice, you know, beautiful tan, orangey color. Uh, but they couldn't have been separated by uh, by, uh, by their uh, dying more than about ten or fifteen years max. So then all of a sudden, <clears throat> the whole place gets covered up. This big mammoth uh, gets buried, and you know, mammoths are like huge. They can swim. Uh, they can't swim in mud, and if a tsunami comes in over them rolls them underwater, you know, for who knows how many miles, maybe 20 miles. 
then they're going to get buried in the sand. <clears throat> so this thing, uh, hmm. this one, you, you know, he got buried. He, he got when he died, uh, his uh, he must have been in some real loose sand, got buried in loose sand. And then the uh, <clears throat> the tusk roiled a little bit. They turned a little bit in their sockets. But in some of these mastodons like this big one, the, the biggest four tusk are, uh, on record from down around, uh, oh, you would know where it is, but it's around San Antonio, about 100 miles east of there. Its tusk had never moved. Like, there was an eighth inch uh, a section around the tusk that went into the head, which is where the glue was that held them together. So when this thing got buried, he got buried so quickly that those tusks, even as he began to decay, couldn't fall over. They just stayed there exactly in place and, and uh, were replaced by mineral pretty much right there. <clears throat> so wow. there must have been a lot of these things. That there are mammoths all over Texas. Uh, Kansas is covered up in them. And, I, you know, it's a mystery to me, but they're all at about 10 to, 10 to 15 feet of uh, sand and gravel up here. Uh, there must have been a, a heck of a tsunami or two that, <clears throat> that came through here a few thousand years ago. That You know, they say these things are 10,000 years old. Well, we've been doing a lot of tests on uh, carbon 14 tests and, and other other tests, and they're just not that old. I know they say that that's their you now it's what they teach in college, but colleges are usually pretty much behind the times. They don't, you know, they got a lot of money, but they don't keep up with what's going on. <clears throat> it's the activist guys that <clears throat> get get all this the new stuff. So something happened yep. about 3,500 years ago, as best we can tell. And uh, maybe once or twice, and buried all these things, <clears throat> and it's just it's just kind of a mystery. Now, that was one of the things uh, you know too that I had. Um, just going to ask you because that's when you know you have the academia. They have the they have this set years where they you know this is what they we always hear the term. This is the consensus, and that mm -hmm. was one of the things I wanted to get to you is where. When you were looking at there, what have you found that has led you to to that point where you're just like, when you're saying this is ten thousand, you know, or older, you know, this is clearly, you know, I'm thinking this is, you know, this is much younger than that, and that's what I wanted to get you. It's like, what what have you been finding that has led you to come to that conclusion that these are much younger than what well, that we're being told? The Burning Tree Mastodon from uh, Licking County, Ohio. <clears throat> is a perfect example. It was a whole skeleton just missing the back left leg, I think. <clears throat> and the long tail is missing all of its toes. And the ribs had been cut uh, as though the, somebody had skinned it. Uh, the tail was taken off. So somebody skinned that whole thing. Well, the, the hide must have weighed 2,000 pounds or more. So a local Indian or a local white people aren't going to skin some 2,000 pounds. You just know you couldn't do anything with it. But if you know that in Ohio, <clears throat> there are these mounds there where there are men that are uh, 10 feet tall. Uh, there are men that are 9 feet tall, probably women 8 feet tall. Now you can see, okay, if some of these guys, and some of them were said to be 15 feet tall by the Indian tribes, if they saw that elephant <clears throat> uh, who had been in a, a big fight with another bull, he was injured in several places and went off to the peat bog, apparently, so he could swallow without chewing and eat flowers instead of bark. And they just wait till he sat there and bled to death and over butchered him. So I think it makes a case for the giants. Well, they weren't that long ago. Plus the living bacteria uh, in, in its intestines, there was a <clears throat> couple of lady scientists, uh, probably in their 50s or 60s. Uh, uh, I don't know if they were professors, but they were lady scientists. My friend uh, Stan was <clears throat> there talking to them. They looked at the Bernie Tree Mastodon poster and they said, this this has living bacteria in it? And she said, yes, ma'am. There were, there were several kinds. They took them to a lab and they all became active. And uh, they was considered the oldest fossil in the world, those things, uh, living fossil. Anyhow, they were... Wow. And they looked at that. There's micrographs there of the the uh, uh, the bacteria. Well, they know their bacteria, right? So, she the one lady. She says uh, she looks at, at Stan and she says, uh, "says you think the Bible could be true?" <laughs> he didn't say anything about it, but she uh, she said uh, 
He said, well, well, yeah, sure. She said, they looked at him a long time, said this, these, this bacteria doesn't live but about maximum 300 years. So this can't be but a few hundred years old. And these, these are lady scientists. We've said that same thing. They did get a, they took a, a section out of the right shoulder blade and did a carbon 14 test on it. But, you know, they, uh, carbon 14, you know, you can find, we found 20 samples of dinosaur bones with carbon 14 still in them. So they can't, by their own standards, they can't be 65 or 80 million years old. They have to be a few thousand. So when they tell you they're, they're 11,000, 600 years in that, that shoulder blade, I think they got a test, a date that probably said 500 years. And they go, well, we can't have that. That's contaminated. So they do another test until they finally get the test they want, or I don't know, just make one up. I'm not accusing anybody of fraud, but I've seen that happen. Because, it, you know, if you publish on something like that, this Mastodon died 300 years ago <clears throat> when the British were over here hunting. You know, it's well, we can't have that because that doesn't fit our paradigm. So academia, you know, they're, it's, it's sad. <clears throat> they, they're married to that degree. And they have to defend it no matter what. In fact, these, these uh, major scientists told me one day, uh, I guess they thought they'd just be truthful with me. And they said, you know, scientists have our paradigms. I said, yeah, what's a paradigm? <clears throat> well, said a uh, paradigm is something you hold to and believe in, regardless of the introduction of new information. I, I go, what? That's com totally contrary to scientific uh, protocol, isn't it? This is we'll give you an example. And they told about a really famous scientist who got up to give his paper before a Congress of, of world scientists. And, uh, he read his title and they started booing him. They booed him off the stage. This, this scientist is telling me that. He said, they told him, says, we will not uh, publish your paper. Furthermore, we will not even read it. You go, what in the heck? Why would that be? This is a major world-class scientist. And he was a Jew, wasn't even a Christian. And he said, no, it, it corroborates the Noah's flood. We can't have that. So, so much for open-minded science stuff, you know. <clears throat> I, well, that's, that's that's kind of the thing we've encountered with a few people we talk about. So anytime you find something that that doesn't fit the the standard, you know, the dogma, you know, that comes through the you know, Smithsonian. I mean, it, it's well known that they've got in their storage facilities many things that don't fit, you know, the narrative. Right. And they've got them just boxed and set aside you know we can't right. can't have this as part and I, my camera just went so if anybody can hear me still I, i'll hold on a second i gotta figure out what happened to my camera here that's awesome i was doing a quick research real quick the mastodon or the woolly mammoth was the biggest of i mean today's elephant and woolly mammoth correct yeah the the woolly mammoth some of them got to be 20 feet tall uh, but there are mastodons over in England and Greece. They got to be taller than that. Wow. Some of these things had tusks, straight tusks, 17 feet long, sticking out oh, in front of their head. That's, <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, it is. I mean, you just go, well, what did he do with her? What did he eat? It just, I don't know. But <laughs> Always you know, running into stuff. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. that's. I mean, you think like elk too, it's the same way. Like when you see them running through the trees, you know, they got to tilt their head back to make it, you know, to run through there or else all you hear is just, is they're just banging. Yeah. I can only imagine, like you said, these 17 foot long things. It's like you have to nibble on high grass. I mean, it's going to be really hard to eat. Well, or put them down on the grass and just scoot your head along. Let the, let the tusk be like skis. You know, yeah. I guess you could do that. I don't know. But, but these tusks were complete. Oh, it looked to me like a kill site, like someone had rearranged the tusk. But I, I wasn't there, but my, my friend Dick uh, was the one that did the dig. <clears throat> it's a mighty big animal. There's one over in uh, England, I think. It's just as big. And you think England, giant mastodons with 17-foot long tusk, England. <laughs> and the Beatles never even wrote a song about it. Yeah, what's wrong with everybody? I, I know. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I just, I think, I mean, it, it kind of makes sense, you know, I said, it, when you're noticing like some of the patterns like a kill site, you know, because there's always these holdovers where, you know, these could be something that made it through and it was just wandering the wilderness, you know, and they found some of these holdovers and they, you know, obviously when you're hungry, you're hungry. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's buffalo, you know, it doesn't matter what, you know, what, you know, just happened to be, oh my God, there's a Flintstone steak coming right now. Mm -hmm. I'm getting, you know, we're going to have the ribs like from, from the scene there in the Flintstones. I mean, it's, just, it's, the, I mean, that's a massive animal. And like you said, with your evidence, I mean, it, it looks like, like you said, it could, could have been an actual like kill pit where they were killing them, butchering them. Well, you know, there was another Mastodon with, uh, I, I was asked to be involved in the, the, the site and the, it's called the Galt site here in Texas. And they had taken a Mastodon skull out of there, which they don't talk much about, but they had uncovered this large 10 foot square area where all these um, paleo uh, points were still in the ground, you know, and rocks and all kinds of stuff. Since I'm famous for molding difficult things still in the dirt, <clears throat> I got all ready to go down there and mold this big area. Then they, they changed their minds and did something else. And I don't know what they finally did with it. But what someone else told me was there was a big Mastodon skull there. Okay, that's cool. But his, his head was full of arrowhead, was full of uh, paleo points. So not only huh. did they, and you don't kill a Mastodon by hitting him in the top of the head. You got to hit him in the eye. You got to hit him in the mouth or the, the, the chest under the, you know, under the leg or something. But it, but it might sort of be like, hooray, we got him. We got him. Let's all throw our spears into him. So <clears throat> clearly a kill site. Clearly man and Mastodons live together. And it wasn't man like some hulking brute that doesn't know anything and dragged his wife around by her hair. These were people probably way smarter than us, healthier than we are, <clears throat> tougher. And look, they survived over here with nothing but sharp rocks and sticks. So yeah. you know, there is a lot of assumptions in academia that you just got to wade over them sometime. Well, I think that's, and that was one of those, I'm, I'm sure you've experienced it when it's like when you encounter something, like you said, you come across this Mastodon, where you can clearly see it has, there was a technology advance other than just, you know, throwing a rock and hitting it. I mean, you can actually clear, see the making, fashioning <clears throat> of a spear. And so when you present this stuff, you can clearly see if I accept this, it's going to invalidate my entire life's work. So I can't do this. I've got to, I've got to <clears throat> figure out a way to bury this in a box. And that's what we've been noticing with Smithsonian. Yep. It's just it's just easier to bury it than it is to try to figure out, okay, where did we get it wrong? That's the problem. And, you know, the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. It doesn't say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money. Well, all kinds of people love money. You know, poor people will cheat each other to get their money. <clears throat> Rich people cheat you at the bank. Uh, if some professor discover something that that undoes what he's been saying all these years you know the money comes to force like okay you're going to get fired for this and a bunch of them have i've got a book that it outlines a bunch of these guys that were real scientists men and women but they went against the paradigm and they said no this isn't true we can't publish this okay give us your keys you're out so <clears throat> You know, the love of money, the love of security and all that, I, I've seen it. I They've told me, some of these guys have told me, they don't believe that millions of your stuff, but you got to protect your job. Well, all right, that's okay, but don't put scientists on your name. You know, that's not a scientist. That's just somebody, uh, it's like Elvis singing a song, but he sang 50 times already. <clears throat> you don't have to believe it. Just got to be a good singer. Yep. So, <clears throat> And here's your list of your books here too that they oh. have on your site. We got to buy um, all the books you can. We uh we need the dough here. In yeah, you, <laughs> yeah. So they you go to mountblanco.com. Yeah, he's got books there. You've also got an art um, and it's a memorabilia spot right too where you have stuff stuff for sale there too. So there, you go to the shop. You got everything. Like I said, gifts, small replicas. That was one cool too. Is that you'll also have replicas of some of these fossils yeah, and we've got, the we've real got fossils anybody. yep yep we got more more replicas i think than just about anybody <clears throat> uh 
there's some really big, big uh, guys out there. Some friends of mine are the tops and they, they have crews, so they can turn out quite a bit more stuff, but, uh, yep. They're, uh, you know, it's like, uh, printing a Rembrandt. Yeah, it's great if you own the Rembrandt, but if you print it, then everybody can enjoy it. So a lot of these bones, it's like, well, they can, there's only one of these skulls and it's going to be in one place. It can't be in any more than one place. So let's make a, let's make a mold of it and, and reproduce it. And it, you know, you can study that, but that's, it's like having a, a Rembrandt print. It's a, uh, it's next, the best thing to have the mm -hmm. real thing. So that's why I love to reproduce stuff. Well, it's, it's like anything. I mean, it's just like, I don't, this isn't a real skull right here. You know, it's just the same thing. You know, it's just a reproduction. It's, just, it's like the same thing. It's like, I really, so it'd be the same with a fossil. It's like, you know, well, I can't afford to have, you know, a, a T-Rex skull, you know, actually a real one. It's like, so it's going to be a lot more affordable to buy, you know, something where you have a recreation, <laughs> like it's the same way, like the Mastodon. It's going to be a lot easier to have that in your house than it is to get, get the actual thing. And that's, that's what's impressive about your, about your museum. There is just the, the amount of fossils in, especially like the full Mastodon skeleton is really impressive that you've got there. We've got a lot of more stuff that isn't on display. <clears throat> Part of it's we've been hit by bad weather for several years now. And man, we just can't, can't get away from that. <clears throat> and we're right now dealing with the, the fourth tornado hit. And, uh, <clears throat> We've got a lot of more stuff. There's uh, a lot more things we have reproduced. We have uh, probably a hundred different uh, fossil tracks. And as far as I know, I've never been in a major museum in the United States anyway, that has that many fossil tracks. And I, we've just, some of them I've molded myself. Uh, <clears throat> some have just come to us, but, but there they are. You can study them. And if we made reproductions of all of those, Everybody can have a set and, and light them, you know, pour sand in them, uh, black sand to see what they really look like. And we've got big foot prints. we got uh, two or three uh, prints. That if, they're, if they're not human, there's a dinosaur out there that had human feet. So <clears throat> we got all that stuff. We don't mind the controversy. You know, we don't have a degree to protect. We're not 51C3, so we're not afraid of anybody. We just tell what we think, just tell what we know. And, and, uh, that's the real freedom of being independent. It's, uh, it's hard because you don't get a lot of donations, you know, from rich people, but <clears throat> you don't have controls over you. Like some of them do. And we don't want to be controlled. We want to tell what we know and tell it when we know it, you know, and tell everybody. So <clears throat> I got a picture up here of that, you know, cause you were talking about the giants. Yeah. That, that, uh, I've, I've told, I don't know. That, that's the most popular thing in my museum, and it's not even a fossil; it's a sculpture. <laughs> yep. <laughs> just... You know, the way it happened back in about '96 or something. This professor out in Florida uh, contacted me, said, "Hey, would you do me a sculpture of a leg bone that fits the dimensions of these three localities he found over there in, in uh, <clears throat> Homs, Uranzora, and uh, Euphrates Valley?" And he gave me the dimensions. The dimensions were, uh, it was 47 and a half inches long about. So I sculpted one, made a mold of it, and sent him the, the cast so he could show his students how big it was. So that's the origin of that. And uh, the news story that he sent to me was, uh, it's about time, I think was the name of the newsletter. And as far as I could trace, uh, I, I found the old gentleman's widow who was in uh, Iowa or somewhere. And I really, you know, just I tried real nicely to see if we could access our files and find out that that uh, road road construction engineer's name, who f saw these giant legs, <clears throat> leg ball or these giant skeletons. He says it was back in the fifties, I guess, nineteen fifties. They were putting in roads in in three places, and in three places they were bulldozing a a, a hill which turned out to be a burial mound. And then there were these giant skeletons. He doesn't say they're in sarcophagi, but a lot of them are. They're in, they're in uh, stone caskets, 12 feet uh, long, Jeez. beautifully finished. It's like, come on, some millionaire had to, to make the dang thing. <clears throat> so he measured them 
And you say, well, what happened to bones? Well, you know, it's the 50s. That stuff's dry. They don't have any way to preserve it. That's not their job. They got to put that road through. So they grab whatever they can, the swords, the gold and all that, and throw it in the back of the pickup. They, they grab the jaw, maybe, maybe that leg bone, but it falls apart. Or they call the authorities. Maybe they came, got it, dug it up properly. We don't know. Smithsonian. But, yeah. But I, I told, I tell everybody, it's just a sculpture. You know, it's based on a human bone the, that I, I, I base it from. So yeah, I'm just, it's just there to illustrate how big this guy was. You know, I saw, I blew up a drawing of a, a, a human skeleton and then place the leg bone over it, like you see in that, that photograph there, just to show people, okay, here, this guy, if he's standing on the floor, would come up to his chest, would come up to uh, about nine feet. So he had another two or three feet, four feet on the top of that. Jeez. It's a mighty big guy. Yeah. And they go, well, that is, that's unreasonable. Nobody could be that tall. Well, go read the Bible. Talks about King Og. Now, King Og's not a figment of somebody's imagination. King Og was one of the principal kings of the giant tribes over there. And uh, he's not a figment. He's true. Well, that guy had to be about 13 or 14 feet tall himself. His shoulders would have been four and a half, five feet wide. So now stand up against some guy like that. Okay. It's not like a seven foot tall basketball player, which is impressive enough. If you've ever, mm -hmm. you know, talked to a basketball player, it's like, geez, you're big. <clears throat> so. <Yep. clears throat> no, I, I played basketball. Have... I had a teammate that was six foot 10. And so, yeah, it's, like I said, I, it's, it's, it's one of those, it's a rare experience for me, you know, at six, three to look up at somebody. So it's, it's always, it's that weird feeling. I'm like, ah, oh, that's what people go through when they, when they're talking to me, I'm like, ah, oh, I'm not used to my looking up. <laughs> you know, we're, we're the, um, to a man that size, we would be about the equivalent of a year and a half old child. And yeah. they wouldn't just be twice as tall as we are today. Uh, they would be probably a hundred times stronger. So, you know, when <clears throat> old, uh, everybody knows about old, old Goliath, you know, they, they know mm -hmm. he existed. And <clears throat> when he's standing out there, you know, he might have had four, four brothers, the five of those guys and their dad, he's standing out there uh, cursing the, the Israelites, making fun of them and all this sort of stuff. It's like, come on, send me your best guy out here. We'll have a fight. And whoever wins will be the slaves of the others. Well, he's talking to Saul. Saul is seven feet tall, probably. Uh, Goliath's only maybe nine and a half, ten and a half feet tall. It's not like he is afraid of the giants, but one to one, he probably couldn't beat him. So they're scratching their heads like, what are we going to do? That's when David showed up and knocked a hole in his head. <clears throat> but uh, that, that guy might have been a, uh, the runt of the funny. They might have sent the younger brother out there. Hey, go out there and insult him. You know, mm -hmm. earn your earn your dues. <clears throat> and they finally killed all his brothers. So it's people say, oh, well, man, nobody could stand up that. They couldn't be that tall. They'd fall apart. Well, no, they wouldn't. I've showed people. Look, here's, here's a photograph uh, from the 1940s, I think, of an elephant, a grown African elephant standing on his front feet, not on the ground, but on a stool about three feet high. And they stand on their hind legs, okay? They didn't fall apart. Now, they're not meant to do that, to walk on all fours. But uh, as people grow, unless they're ill, unless they're acromagliacs, you know, then you're not, you're not normal. You've just got a pituitary out of, out of whack. But if you're, if you're growing uh, normally, you're going to grow exponentially. The, the higher you go, the more brown you get. So it that your bones get bigger and all that stuff. So it's not a little mess. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a fallacy. It's just ignorance, I think, on the, the part of most people. <clears throat> so well, I think there's a lot of people that have a hard time grasping, you know, and that's one of the things like when we set out on this podcast, I I didn't know a whole lot about the giants. And when we started doing all the stuff with giant mounds, you know, and I've I've more and more, I mean, I feel like doing the Indiana Jones thing. It's like, we need to have an expedition to just go, you know, unearth one of these mounds and just right here live on Facebook, YouTube, mm -hmm. you know, just do a live, you know, oh, you know, excavation thing where it's a 24 seven. So when, when this is actually discovered, people are like, okay, now what? I mean, you got this 
it's right here. It's like you said, here's that stone, the stone caskets that are talked about, you know, here's these bones, you know, here's a skull that's this gigantic, you know, three, four times the size of our head, you know, it's like, okay, now what? I mean, you have to, you know, you have to admit finally that there is something here. You've got, well, a, you've got a specter behind you there, Austin. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the uh, uh, stone work around the world, you know, all the stuff in uh, Peru and Pumapunco and places like that and Baalbek, that's one thing. You, you, just, you can't, it's hard to believe that normal guys did that stuff and why they would do it. You know, what do you need with a, uh, a platform of, st of stones that weigh a million and a half to three million pounds each. But so not, notwithstanding, <clears throat> there have been lots of uh, stone caskets found 10 or 12 feet long. Well, you're going to put a 10 or a five foot guy in there, some six foot pioneer. No, you know, yeah. us and the Indians, the white people and the Indians over here, we bury ourselves in the, in the dirt. Now we bury each other in, you know, caskets and cement and all that sort of stuff. But going back 100 years, you just put people in the ground. And the Indians did the same thing, or in some case, they might build a mound over them. But yep. these, these mounds you're talking about, come on, you don't need 3 million pounds of dirt to cover up one guy. You know, and, and if he's a, what, what, who has that kind of importance? I don't know, maybe Mousy Tongue and all those guys there, and some of those Chinese emperors apparently. Uh, were able to com com uh, command that sort of uh, treatment. But there's mounds all over Ohio and uh, the, the uh, Ohio Valley, Tennessee, mm -hmm. here in Texas, and you name it. And it's just, they're incredible. So does that say anything about uh, who built them? Because it just doesn't make sense that, that the Indians are us who had our hands full trying to shoot a deer and pick some berries to go out and, and build these, these gigantic mounds. <clears throat> so it, it, and you put all that stuff together. It's not just an incident here and an incident there. It's uh, repeated. There's so much of it that you can't deny. Yeah. There's a pattern here and it doesn't fit normal uh, patterns. So <clears throat> by the way, I don't know if you know it, but over there somewhere and again, I can't think of the place, but some guy was on the beach out there in uh, Florida and he saw bones coming out of the, uh, out of the sand. So he starts digging them up and doing things with them. And here's this one. Uh, I don't know what it was. It looked like a bison bone to me, but it might've been a mammoth uh, leg, uh, uh, arm bone or something. But on here is this beautiful uh, uh, drawing of a mastodon, clearly a mastodon. Uh, it looks like it's about two and a half inches long, cut with a sharp rock. You know, it's incised into the bone. They took it to the American Museum of uh, Natural History, I think, and they made a they made a mold of it, and cast of it, and put it on display. And it was well intended. <clears throat> Just that one little cast of the thing. Um, he wanted me to try to sell it, and I, I advertised it around. I guess he finally got it sold. But uh, you know to they they have depicted it up until recently. Mastodon hunters, mammoth hunters were all just brutes. You know, they could barely say ugh. Well, no, look at their artwork, man. If you know anything about artwork, you know they weren't brutes. These weren't stupid people. Besides that, they're doing it all in the dark. Hey, here you go. How'd you get that? Yes. There it is. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I think that's uh that looks like a mammoth bone. But it, it's beautifully drawn, and that ain't you yes, know, you can't you make mistakes. Card. You got the carving. You got the tusks right there. <clears throat> Anybody, I can zoom in see, a little bit. See there. his tusks sticking up. Yeah, beautiful yep. work. That front leg is perfect. It's perfect, and he's uh, <clears throat> you know, it's I guess it's debatable. Is it a mastodon or a mammoth? And but, you can see it just down there. Yep, on that on the chunk of bone there, you can just see it's just easy carved right there. Yep, and it's like one stroke. Uh, art that's hard to do if you're a dummy you know what these guys weren't it's it's all come down to us because of darwin and darwin gave a lot of people an excuse to not believe in god not go to church not do anything right cheat on each other and all that sort of stuff because he convinced people well the bible isn't true because evolution is true in millions of years 
So they've told us all this stuff to make ancient man look more primitive as though he was trying to become something other than an ape and become us. They've given up a complete false view of what all those uh, cavemen over there in, in Europe are. The people over here, they've just completely misrepresented it. And, and it's, uh, it's so unscientific because, you know, it's, it's, judging, it's judging a book on the cover. You get a really good artist to do a great cover. Uh, you might want to buy the book because it's a great cover, but nothing inside. So you can't, you can't mm -hmm. do science based on looks. You can start off and say, yeah, this looks like that, and that, that looks like this. But just to say this guy's got a heavy brown and a big solid teeth and a, and a strong jaw, he must have been a brute. Oh, well, wait a minute. That, that, that heavy brow is actually an advantage. And his brain is bigger than yours. So why is he primitive? Why is he depicted as some hulking brute that, you know, just eats meat raw? You know, it's a misnomer. <clears throat> In fact, have you ever heard of the Kennewick man? Mm -hmm. Yep. You have? Yes. Okay. Dr. Bonishan was one of the guys that, that worked on that. He's gone now, but he uh, told me a little bit about it, and he was lamenting the fact that, you know, what happened wasn't right. He said it was not an Indian. That was somebody before the Indians got here. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's what irritates me is uh, – that these uh, socially politically correct uh, academics are not supposed to be that way. They're not supposed to be governed by politics. And if they are, they need to say up front, I'm a this or a that. But to always be uh, making every skeleton uh, an American Indian, you know, some of those American Indians out of area hated those other Indians. In fact, I, I don't have time to tell you right now, but had a little altercation with some <laughs> Comanches one time, you know, they set me straight on the Apache. <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't think the Apaches felt the same way about them. So they wouldn't care if you dug up an old Apache, right? Well, if you dug up some guy, some old white guy from somewhere, what do they care? You know, if they're trying to be politically correct, is that, is that, uh, that our man? That's a, yeah, that's a Kennewick man. Okay. Yeah, he looks like, uh, it looks like, Pretty much like uh, you guys. <laughs> like Austin used to before he cut his hair off. Well, see, that's dumb. You know, yeah. that's because it's too hot there. <laughs> it, was, it was too damn hot. <laughs> Got to protect your head from the sun, man. Yeah, uh, so yeah tell him about it. Yeah, you should see. Yeah, you should see. He looked like a he, he looked like a ginger strawberry when he came back from his fishing trip. I shaved my head. I shaved my head Friday after work. I went 40, 30 miles off the coast to go fishing. Forgot my hat, and my entire head is so burnt. My face is burnt. <laughs> my brother goes, you should have shaved your head two days later. I said, I didn't think about it, man. God, <laughs> it still hurts. Well, you see what I've got on here? Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. I had my straw hat, but, you know, doing 40 miles well, per hour on a boat, like, you lose it. So there you go. I yeah. just tried to put it back on, and, yeah, no, I, I'm burnt. Yep. I forgot. <laughs> Yeah, it's one of those things when you're down here, it's like you got to keep, you know, keep the hat on because there's not much up, you know, there's not much garden upstairs. So it's like, yeah, you got to, it's well, all well, migrating south, like the, like the mastodons. They've they're, all they're migrated just, south. South or, here's a th something for old mastodons. <clears throat> in my museum one day about uh, 15 years ago, a young man came in from a local ranch town over here. And uh, we were talking about stuff and this and that, and Mastodons came up, and he said, "Well, you know, my grandmother was is Cherokee, okay." And uh, she says that the the uh, bison drove the Mastodon off the plains of Texas over into the Piney Woods. Really? Yeah. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Cherokees know anything about the Mastodon? Yeah, they were here when the Mastodon was here. Well, when did the Cherokees get here? I can guarantee you it, wasn't, it was about 3,500 to 4,000 years ago because they had to come with the Middle East. Uh, they're one of the, we don't know if they're Hamites or Japhethites or whatever, but they came from one of those three sons, made their way over here, and <clears throat> they knew enough about the plains to know that the buffalo herds were just going like crazy. They, they produce a lot, reproduce a lot quicker than, than elephants do. 
So there's no point in her telling him that if it wasn't true. Why would some grandmother make up a story like that? You know, grandmothers don't tell stuff like that. So again, you can't prove it. We weren't there. Uh, I'm sure that that one was probably passed away, but uh, that was her grandson. And, <clears throat> you know, you can wait all day for positive proof about everything, but the preponderance and the bulk of evidence, uh, you know, or, or circumstantial evidence can finally win you a court case, unless you're in academia dealing with fossils. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, it's kind of hard when you go up against the money. And it's kind of when you were saying that, um, kind of open the segue to that. I was going to ask you now, have you, have you found any dinosaur records so far in the sea, ancient seabeds in your area? Uh, dinosaur bones, you mean? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, <clears throat> out here we've got the, the uh, Triassic red beds just a few miles out of town. And down about 300 feet, you, you hit a sandstone layer. Uh, it's a real hard brown sandstone, kind of a conglomerate. Uh, it looks like it looks like pavement. It looks like like you've dug up the pavement. It's actually ironstone with rocks in it. <clears throat> and by the way, those rocks are subangular. They're 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 angular and subangular, and some of them are rounded. If they're angular in sandstone, that means they didn't come from very far. They didn't wash down some stream for you know thousands of years. They were buried yeah. pretty quickly. So, so there's a kind of a mystery there. But you go down under those things, right on the bottom of that layer of brown sandstone are these Triassic crocodiles. Uh, I found one out there was a broken jaw of a, of a small phytosaur about 10 feet long. And <clears throat> teeth were still in it. I tried chiseling it out of that sandstone. I just gave up. I mean, you know, this is, you'll never get it out. But you're going down in the clays, the three, three colors of clays underneath it. The place is full of these giant crocodiles. And somebody corrected me one time. I was calling them dinosaurs. And they said, oh, there are no dinosaurs there in the Triassic, in the Dockham. I go, well, yeah, there are. You heard of Coelophysis. Coelophysis, that's that one they found out in, uh, uh, you know, uh, where is it out there? Uh, <clears throat> in New Mexico, the Ghost Ranch. Mm -hmm. Ghost Ranch, I think they took out something like a thousand of these little dinosaurs out there and they, and they quit. Well, those are dinosaurs. All right. <clears throat> they look kind of like a little velociraptor sort of thing, but there's a, uh, they're giant crocodiles. I've, I've got parts of one. The, the, one of the back teeth <clears throat> is the same size as a T-Rex tooth. And the front teeth are nearly an inch and a quarter across. That's a crocodile teeth. If y'all know anything about Florida Crocs, you ain't going to find anything in Florida with a front tooth an inch wide. I don't think. No. Anyway. I don't. Yeah, because that's that's pretty good size. I mean, that's just, yeah. yeah this. And that, that fits a head probably eight or ten feet long. So there they are. Wow. <clears throat> T-Rex just wouldn't venture down there to get a drink because that thing would just bite the head off. You know, they were huge. And those Crocs are powerful. The T-Rexes are powerful, but Literally, you know, you've seen crocs jump out of the water and grab a, uh, a wildebeest and all that. Mm -hmm. well, they grab a T-Rex, wrestle him down and drown him. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> but if you, um, uh, you go all over the red beds out here over into, uh, down to post about 30, 40 miles south of here. One of the most famous paleontologists in the Triassic red beds <clears throat> uh, discovered, oh my gosh, a bird. And I think he found two birds. Man, what are we going to do now? Any birds down here in the, with these crocodiles supposed to be uh, 180 million years old. And that's a way long time before they had dinosaurs that turned into birds. But, yep. you know, he had to publish. It pretty well did it his career. But I saw the bones. And I said, well, if it's my presupposition, it looks like a crow. <clears throat> I also found a, a mammal. <laughs> <laughs> which I didn't see, but I saw, I, I asked the professor, I said, so I, I hear you found a mammal. And he reluctant to tell me, he said, well, uh, yes, uh, true mammal, but very primitive. I, what does that mean? He's a mammal. He's down there with these crocodiles. He, you know, he's not simpler than a, than a uh, mammal today. So again, you gotta be, you know, he wrecked his career. 
So why go ahead and destroy it by saying, look, I found a mammal down there a million mm -hmm. years before they were supposed to have existed. <clears throat> now, do you think it's the same cataclysmic thing, kind of like what we were talking about earlier with uh, Macedons, where that's what buried these creatures? Because if something that size and that's that much of an apex predator, you know, you're going to, there shouldn't have been a reason for them to die off so quickly. So it'd have no. to have been something like that where asteroid impact, something hit, caused a massive tsunami, tidal wave, buried every, all these things at the same time. Because I said, <clears throat> for them to be that long, I mean, to have such a overlap, between, there'd have to be a, some reason why some one of these would have survived to now. Well, if they, if they rule the earth for millions of years and all of a sudden they're gone, they, they're buried in their own mud. <clears throat> That's not even, that's, that just doesn't make sense. But if you look at the earth, you know, the earth kind of fits back together in this rough, kind of rough square, but you can see it's been split apart. And in my opinion, that's probably where there's the, you know, the Bible talks about the fountains of the great deep opened up and up comes all this water, chemicals, muds, uh, rocks, so all sorts. And, and they shoot up in the air a hundred miles, come down in layers it, they've turned into something else by that time. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Okay. Then it starts raining. And when that those fountains split, it shifted the ground. Well, you know, we know what happened in, uh, in Japan when they had a, a tsunami down there. That's nothing compared to what, uh, if you separate the land by uh, 100 feet or 100 miles, what's that going to do to the land? It's going to cause liquefaction and any any ground that has water in it is going to uh, turn to liquid mud the water's going to rush up plus now you've got a tsunami all over the earth and yeah. it, it, you've got us the the uh movement's going to the east and it's going to the right to the west and it comes around the earth and bangs into itself and forms a uh, strata the strata of the world is really complicated and hard to understand unless you figure in uh, a major catastrophe. And then subsequent ones after that in the next next few hundred years, that's probably what got the mammoths down at Texas and Florida. Something shifted. Something happened. You know, maybe the earth turned on its actions. We don't know. But there's, a, there's good reason to believe that the ice age started. Uh, something happened. The earth tilted. And it put Alaska and Siberia into the freezing zone, which it wasn't previously. So all those mammoths and mastodons couldn't migrate south quick enough to be keep them uh, from being buried. So it, it's not That's popular, good. you know, but to me, the, the, uh, <clears throat> that does explain a lot of the geology. And I've seen it all over the country. Wow. Yeah, no, this, and then I have one other thing, too, to, uh, is... Have you found um, any records of, because there's always been in, through all lore, you know, going back to the days, you know, of talking of flying, you know, the flying humanoid. Right. So, you know, so everything from vampires to, you know, just you go down through mm -hmm. the cryptids things. Have you in your, have you found anything that kind of leads credence to this? Like there might've been something along this line, or is this just mm -hmm. one kind of, you know, great storytelling? No, I think it absolutely does. In fact, my new edition of the of the Giants Against Evolution book, I've got about 18 pages in the back of just one thing after another saying, hey, check this stuff out. There's something to it all. And I've, I've got uh, a lot of the, the humanoids with wings. <clears throat> they're, they're so similar the world over. Down in uh, Peru, you got the three-fingered men uh, with wings. Uh, and they don't look like Peruvians always. You know, they don't... They, and, <clears throat> There's a, uh, you know, all over the ancient world, you got, you got um, angels with wings or men with wings and women with mm -hmm. wings. You know, you, it's, again, it's <clears throat> why would they make something up? You know, you could. I mean, we make up novels today and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, if, if there really was something like that, if there really were these principal angels that, that you know, the Nephilim, uh, their, their descendants, well, that fits the story. That That's like, oh, well, that's who they were depicting. No, no, it's all just made up. Well, the Nephilim thing isn't made up. <clears throat> that's a true fact. Those those uh, sons of God, people, oh, I don't talk about that's a Bible. Well, disprove it. 
and their sons and, and I think daughters, that's who the gods of the ancient world were. And they depicted themselves uh, and moved those big stones around for which there was no possible use. You know, like at Cusco over there in Peru, there's this wall over there that uh, a sexy woman. It's thousands of these giant stones that you can't imagine how they moved or even carved them. And they don't do anything. They don't hurt cattle. Uh, they don't, you know, protect from the enemy. They're just there to look at. So, well, yeah, maybe it's like they said, there were these, these giant blonde haired people came in and told us how to do all this stuff or did it for them. I don't know. But yes, there's plenty of evidence as far as I'm concerned for the flying humanoids. And right here in Crosbyton, with Mothman. <laughs> yeah, my, Michael said, Jesse, you, you commented, it's like, what about Mothman? I'm like, yeah, it's definitely, that's the thing. It could be a, could definitely be a holdover. From well, Monday. and the holdover thing, <clears throat> actually, nobody knows what's extinct. We just know what we don't see. Yep. But, you know, all, every, every week, just about, they're finding some new animal. Uh, <clears throat> over there in Vietnam, with all the boys who were over there, they never saw this turtle with a six foot long neck or this strange little goat of some kind. And, you know, a few years later they found him. Well, you know, if you just said they were there, the, you, you called you a liar because, well, those, we don't have those now. So nobody knows what's extinct. So I tell everybody, don't, you know, we, we don't see it. Don't say it's extinct. You just don't know. Yeah. Very, tr very true. And then um, one, like I said, as we're getting close to here to the end, um, I wanted to, uh, to bring it up, I want to let you give you the floor here and let you talk about your museum and kind of give it people like where they can, how they can get a hold of you, the best way, what they can do to help support you. And do, and if there's any pictures you want me, I can bring those up as you go. So, okay. It's the called the Mount Blanco Fossil Museum. We don't pronounce it correctly, but that's our problem. It's at uh, 124 West Main Street which is Highway 114-82, runs right through town. We're right on the square. <clears throat> uh, you can reach uh, for more information with uh, at www.mountblanco.com. Just leave out the little dot between Mount and Blanco, and you got it. <clears throat> so if you want to find out more about what we've got, we've got a lot of stuff for sale. Uh, we're actually looking for a secretary as soon as we get the museum put back together. After this last tornado hit, <clears throat> And if anybody wants to contribute, man, we we uh, we've got to come up with fifty thousand bucks for a roof. And until we do, it's just going to rain inside the museum and keep things messed up. So anybody wants to help, uh, boy, we'd appreciate anything anybody wants to do. You want to come by? The place is torn up. You can look through the window, or if we're there, you can come in and still see what we're doing. The stuff's all there. It's just everything's sitting on tables now. When since the the drop seating got wet and fell in and just messed everything up. <clears throat> but uh, we're, we're still the largest working non-evolution fossil museum in the country, maybe in the world. And we don't just stick with, with bones. Uh, the Naga Man sculpture there, I think that comes up somewhere. Friend of mine, yeah, <clears throat> uh, one of the Bigfoot hunters is actually hunting bear. Yeah, right there. The yeah he stumbled on this... Uh, uh, this crazy looking sculpture and and got it to me and i thought good grief what is that so i made a mold of it and we're selling cast of it to hopefully somebody out there would get it and study it or like who did this uh, what era is it from what does it mean it's got this snake coiled around this person's head it's really a strange deal and this uh, guy was uh he had been to india and so he he named it naga man and i think that's probably what it is he just stumbled on it out there hunting bear. So wow. we're, we're not limited to bones. You know, we're, we're interested in everything. That's why we're also the Institute of Omniology, uh, because we study everything. Everything's important and uh, everybody's important. We want to know, you know, we focus where we can, but, you know, we pay attention to everything and everybody. Yeah, it looks like, yeah, you had that, you know, car, you look at our different articles, the Star Child, then you have Cinnamon. The Paracas skull. Yeah, those have all been on ancient aliens and a bunch of stuff like that. Uh, I don't have control over that once they leave uh, the studio. 
But I had the real skull of cinnamon. That's a cast there. And uh, studied it, made an hour movie, and told them what I thought, and gave them an analysis of it, which they didn't even use on Ancient Aliens. It's like, guys, I did all this, went to a lot of trouble here. Y'all got to talk about this stuff. <clears throat> For one thing, the back of her front teeth are shoveled out like, um, like a North American Indian. But she's from Peru. And... <clears throat> She's also, they said, oh, I was a 15 year old boy. And I go, no, I think it's a 17 year old female uh, that don't know what happened to her. But uh, uh, this is the real skull, right? That, no, it's a cast. <clears throat> this is the cast. Yeah, wow. so I'm, Impressive I'm portrait, cast, sir. I'm a portrait painter, so I can make things Man. Work just like I, matter of fact, I fooled myself one time. I was painting a big uh, fossil thing and I, and I got through and I shipped it out. I go, oh my gosh. I've shipped the real stone out. <laughs> so after that, I started leaving one little spot that I didn't paint because, uh, you know, that's, that's my job is to make portraits. And uh, I, I can um, make teeth look translucent. That's a little trick, but that makes them look real. Also, they're nasty. You can't just paint the teeth white. That's not the way they are. They didn't, they didn't brush their yeah. teeth and they ate cocoa and all that sort of stuff. So uh, no, I'm, I'm just, you know, Got compliments, man. That, that was, I was convinced that was the real that was a real skull. Well, if you see that stick coming down, that stand, that's always mm -hmm. the 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 cast. <clears throat> wow, that's yeah. Because I just said, I, yeah, that's a cast. That's that's the number one cast that I sent to them. I had to mold the thing, paint it, get it to them, along with the real skull. Uh, so <clears throat> I don't know why they wanted both of them, but anyway. They did, but there, there's a, you know, there's, there's a, the man with the hair and the guy yeah. that owns it. Giorgio? Yeah, yes, Giorgio. <laughs> yeah, I like him. <clears throat> and the fellow that owns it there had never seen it till it got to New York City. You look at the back. I don't know if you can tell the back teeth there on the lower jaw. Those are way too worn down for an 18 year old and they're way, way more worn down for a 15 year old. So I don't know why her teeth are so worn down, but you know that's one of the things they really should have pointed out. <clears throat> yeah, then sure. What? Yeah. No, but yeah. So everybody, if you go, if you go to mountblanco.com, I said there's a donation part where you can go there, or you simply go to the shop. Got our products. You can get his books. They've got the gifts and the replicas. Uh, so yeah, definitely go ch check them out, reach out to them, phone number, it's in Cros Crosbyton, is that how you say the name? Crosbyton, Texas, yep. Crosbyton, Texas. Um, so it's one of those, if definitely in the area, you know, I got to stop in and at least say hi and see how the, see how things are going. So that's, yeah, that's yeah. a great, you know, great resource. So anybody wants more information for you uh, about the Mastodons and also the Mount Blanco Fossil Museum. So Joe, Taylor, really appreciate you coming on the show, sir. Uh, it's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, abs absolutely. Like I said, we'll keep um, keep in touch and, and see how things are going. And hopefully, hopefully, you guys can start raising the money so that way you can get the fix and people can come together and at least you know at least get the roof patched. So that way you can you can start fixing stuff as opposed to just keep keep going over the same thing over and over again. Yep, yep. And it's uh, we're just going to have to. Pull out all the stops to raise the money. I, I, I don't know where it'll come from, but <clears throat> it's got to be done. We can't let the building destroy itself. Yeah. So, well, best of luck with with that. And like I said, take, once again, thank you again, and we'll be in touch. All right. Have a good all evening, right. gentlemen. Yeah, you too. All right. Bye-bye. All right, everybody. And this, this episode is brought to you by Nanny Cakes. Go to Nanny Cakes 407 on Facebook or give her a phone call at 407-923-2898. In the Central Florida area, mention the two beards. We are without a beard, if you haven't noticed. Uh, he is off visiting his new nephew. His, his nep nephew was born last, ni last night, early morning, and so he, he went to go see his, his nephew. So he's much... Much deserved time off. So everybody, you know, congratulations, Chris's brother on the, the little one there. And so and redbubble.com, get myself back on track here. Three Beards Podcast is our, our site. 
there. Go there, check out the merchandise. Um, thank you to everybody who's bought a shirt already. Um, so we've already got four. I'm not sure. Austin's also um, picked up a tank top. So, so yeah, it's, it's, you know, so he's, he's got those. So he, I keep telling him he's got to show me so that I can actually see what they look, see what they I'll, look I'll like. So. On next episode. All right. All right. Sounds good. So that everybody, we, we hit 200 subscribers on YouTube. So that's pretty <laughs> cool. Yeah. Keep that up. Like I said, we're, we're going and just kind of give you a little heads up. There's going to be some exclusive content going to be made here in the near future. Working title right now is beard trimmings, beard trims, you know, where it's like, I'm going to go over a little clip. I'm going to kind of in depth, little like 10 to 15 minute, just in depth, little topics, things on different stuff. So we'll be doing that. So have some little exclusive content and that'll be on YouTube. So subscribe to that, um, our channel, three beards podcast. So that way you can not miss those and see, watch the show here as well. Um, we will be rebroadcast on Thursday nights at 10 PM Eastern time, courtesy of Patriot radio, download the Zeno radio app. And when you're there, thank J and J beard company for um, being willing to put us on their th Patriot radio. So thank you to them. Everybody appreciate you watching Joe Taylor. Thank you again, everybody check out Mount Blanco dot com mount blanco fossil museum so everybody thanks for watching we will see you later good night